All on Cooper CPAs, located in the heart of East Nashville, offer a wide variety of tax services for individuals and businesses. Contact them at 615-257-0646 and visit their website, allcooper.com, for a full list of services. Well, coming up next on Political Soup, we find a very inconvenient truth for the inconvenient truths. Unfortunately, last week, man, what a mess in Boston. We'll talk about that. And also, Crom Carmichael talks about his favorite Ann Curry, or at least some of the hypocrisy with Ann Curry. We'll explain all that and more coming up next on Political Suit. Bandwidth for today's show is brought to you by SoftLayer.com. We love SoftLayer here at Talkopolis. They are the greatest hosting company ever. They make everything easy. Check out their website at SoftLayer.com. Thanks again for sponsoring the show. Talkopolis, the social media TV network for your city. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome in to Political Soup. I'm Joe Williams with the man, Crom Carmichael, who has all the answers, but I think I may have beat him to one this week. Crom, uh, earlier this week, sent you uh, some information uh, all the way from NASA. Now, you know if it comes from NASA. I saw that. It's got to be true. And no. But, well, <laughs> not necessarily because they're changing their mind after 30 years, according to the article you sent me. I was, I was going to say, and the truth in this one is that uh, the inconvenient truth is really inconvenient now because it may not have been the truth. Crump, they're telling us that uh, global warming may not be what they thought it was and used, used their own research to prove it. Yes, and what would be the best NASA quote ever for, for exactly this? Houston, we, we have, have a problem. problem. <laughs> That's right. I'm, you know, this is the thing. If you go back to 19, in the 70s, yep. we were going to have an ice age. It was going to be global cooling. Mm -hmm. Then that didn't happen, and so then they switched it to global warming. And a guy named James Hansen was the NASA scientist who was kind of the godfather of global warming. And he now is, 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 uh, is apparently just about to retire or either just has retired. He himself has said, you know what? The data shows that global warming is not happening. And, it, and so what you have is you have this 35-year hype that turns out to be nothing but that. And, and the public policy, all of the things that we've done, all of the costs that it's burdened our society with. Now, let me be sure that we're clear about something, Joe. You and I both like clean air and yes. clean water. Yes. That isn't what we're talking about. Correct. We are not talking about pollution. Correct. We both don't like pollution and we want to get rid of it. This is not that. This is about the air that we exhale. CO2, CO2. CO2 I think. Yeah, carbon dioxide. Yeah, okay. And so, and, and that's what they've been claiming would destroy the planet. So when you sent me that article, I just had a big hee-haw. I bet you didn't. Basically what happened is this. <laughs> the, the article explains that earlier this month uh, and the month before, there was this huge uh, explosion, if you will, of, of radio radioactive heat that came from the sun and all the, this, this conglomeration of stars, et cetera. I mean, massive amounts of heat that probably should have heated the earth and maybe burned it up. But instead, I love this part. Instead, in the atmosphere, the CO2 and the NOx, or nitrous oxide, uh, as the art, and I wish I had the quote on the article right now that says, the great coolants, <laughs> the great coolants in our atmosphere dissipated all this heat, and we never knew the difference. Wait a minute. I thought it was the CO2 and the NOx that was going to burn us to the ground. Well, it's... Here's another story that's related to it in the sense of all of the different things we've tried to do to address this so-called terrible problem right. that now a lot of people are acknowledging never was a problem in the first place. And this is an article entitled The Ethanol Spring. Now, ethanol, as, 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 our, as our listeners know uh, and viewers know, is, is when you turn corn into fuel, and that fuel is called ethanol. And well, then, we've called it some other things okay. with a couple of extra okay, steps, right. but that's another story. Okay. okay, and then ethanol is mixed into gasoline. Right. Well, back in 2007, the, the, the futurists and the experts all said the amount of gasoline that we're going to burn in this country is going to, is going to increase dramatically, and, and it's going to reach such and such a level, 
within a certain period of time, and that certain period of time is now, that we've now reached it, five years later, six years later. Right. It turns out that that was the peak in the amount of gasoline usage, and that the amount of gasoline that's used has not gone up, it's actually gone down. The problem with that is that the politicians then said, okay, if gasoline, the usage of gasoline is going up, then we need to increase the production of ethanol, and we need to mandate that it be blended into, into gasoline so that we can alleviate this terrible problem that we see coming that then didn't happen. But the problem is that now the ethanol production, which is subsidized by you and me and all the exactly. other taxpayers, okay, the, it, the, 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 uh, the ethanol production now has to be blended into the gasoline, and it's now, and it's now blowing past the 10% blend rate, which is ruining engines. And so, and, and it, and, and so that incre increases the amount, or decreases the fuel efficiency of the cars. Vehicles, that's correct. And, and it, it takes everything that it was intended to do, and it makes it exactly backwards, which is, once again, another example. And this is why we get into knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. When politicians or anybody says, I can predict the future, and then mandates by law what has to be done to fix that problem, almost every time they were wrong about their prediction, which means that their mandate is harmful, not beneficial. Reminds me of Heaven's Gate's group out in, uh, the, I'm sorry, they were predicting a, an alien ship, though. No, you're exactly right. Here's, here's one of the things that's happened here, Crom. If you look at vehicles today, you'll find many that say flex fuel. Everybody goes, oh boy, well that means it'll run on, on solar or power. No, no, all that means is the engines went through an expensive redesign. The factories went through an expensive retooling to make an engine that could accept ethanol as a fuel or a blend as a fuel. Okay. The other side of that was as America's ethanol is, is being touted as this great answer, you had, and, and some of the conservationists who were so very much for it, have now backed up and said, do you realize how much corn you were using to make ethanol for fuel for vehicles? Do you know how many people we could feed with that corn? Now the catch is that uh, the corn for ethanol and, and, and human consumption corn a little bit different. I mean, it's not, but the point is, we've gone from, oh yes, let's do ethanol. Let's, Oh, you're starving people. Well, and then all the energy that's used to produce the ethanol in the first place. place. So that it can sit and so go nowhere. Can, yeah, but here's what's interesting. And, and that, was, that was interesting what you said about these new engines, and that's in new cars. Yes. But you have, you have tens of millions of old cars whose engines are not built Correct. for, the, for, for a, a, a fuel mixture Correct. of greater than 10% ethanol. Correct. And so that's what's happening is the, the lower income people who have drive, drive older cars are having their cars ruined by the very politicians who say, I care about the poor and the middle class. But partner, let me get on my soapbox here because that's not what's killing them. What has killed them and jobs across this country was the old cash for clunkers. You remember that? We sure. took thousands yes. of, of, of very good late model vehicles off the road and crushed them, destroyed them for no other reason than, you know, maybe they didn't get the mileage that was mandated for them. Millions of dollars involved in government subsidies and right now having, having had family in the used car business, you cannot buy used cars. You can almost buy a new one for what you can buy a used one. But more importantly, what that also did was pulled out of the economy, the parts places, the aftermarket places, uh, the replacement part place. And all of a sudden, the stores don't need to sell anything because the cars aren't there. Well, they don't sell anything, guess what? You don't need money in a factory making and here we go in this, this downward circle. No, cash for clunkers was great on the front end, but the unintended consequence, and that's one of my favorite terms, as yep. you know, we yep. talk about that a lot, but the unintended consequence has been absolutely horrible. Yeah. And kind of the same here. Politicians, once again, messing with the market, and, and as you say, all kinds of things that they didn't e expect. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody didn't expect them, but the politicians sure did. Yeah. The politicians yeah. were focused on trying to create something that was politically popular. 
and they didn't recognize all of the different terrible things that were going to happen as a result of the policy. So well, that's the cash flow conquerors, that's the ethanol, and now, uh, now what we know is 35 years of a hoax that we now can call global warming. Yeah, and NASA said it themselves. The other half is on the, uh, on the cash for clunkers. As I recall, the government who, who, uh, who put forth this program and, and, and mandated this program also held a pretty good stake in one of the, the world's largest car manufacturers. Oh. Not that there's a conflict of interest yeah, there yeah, of any know. kind. All right, I'm on a roll today. It's raining outside, and that just gets me fired up. We're going to take our first break. Crom's going to hit me in the back of the head and calm me down. Stay with us. When we come back, we are going to get a little bit serious. A couple of things that uh, we're going to talk about, uh, the terrible, terrible events in Boston and Benghazi. Is the truth finally coming out, and will it destroy political career? We'll find out. Stay with us on Political Soup. All on Cooper CPAs, located in the heart of East Nashville, offer a wide variety of tax services for individuals and businesses. Contact them at 615-257-0646 and visit their website, allcooper.com, for a full list of services. And welcome back, everybody. Political Soup, Joe Williams, Crom Carmichael. Crom, we like to have a lot of fun on this show. We do. Um, we like to... Uh, poke fun at things and be as, you know, as jovial as we can about issues where we all disagree. Unfortunately, one issue that uh, I think we all agree on to some extent, but more than anything else, none of us are going to joke about, and that's the horrible, horrible events in Boston uh, last week where two terrorists uh, laid bombs in the middle of the Boston Marathon, and uh, the, the intense manhunt to find them. Oh, I mean, it was, you know, you could, it was, it was just wall to wall coverage. And then when they, what was, what was, what's, you know, the, the, the uh, we, we have, we've had now, since, well, even before 9-11, uh, but 9-11 was, I think, the first terrorist attack in the United States. The other terrorist attack were at our embassies and whatnot around the world. Well, you've got, you've got the bombing, um two or three years before, I mean, but they were all small things, nothing that, that really, quote, succeeded or caused the loss of life. Well, no, 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 I'm talking about, I'm not talking about in the U.S. I'm talking okay. about the ones overseas. Yes. Uh, we had, we had some of our embassies were blown right. up. We had, I mean, we're talking about serious explosions. Right. Lots of people killed, a lot of people injured. But 9-11 was the first time that it hit the U.S. There was an attempt in 93 to tip over right. one of the World Trade Center that's that's the towers bomb, yeah, to the other. bombing I'm talking about. Yes, yes, you're right. And that, oh, people got a lot of smoke and everything like that, but it was unsuccessful, but it was an attempt, and it kind of lulled us back to sleep. Yep. Then in 2001, 9-11 happened, but then since then, there have been a whole series of, of efforts yes. to, to create more terrorism, in the U.S., you had the you had the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, the underwear bomber, and that was the flight coming into Detroit. Then you had the Times Square bomber. Right. Uh, I think there was one other one in the, in a restaurant uh, in Washington D.C. where there was a Saudi diplomat or something where they were trying to blow him up and everybody in the restaurant. And all of these failed for one reason or another, and most of it because the devices failed, not because our intelligence was that great. Now, having said that. We've had probably hundreds and maybe even thousands of times where we have thwarted yes. a terrorist because of our intelligence. So, so, so this is the purpose of what, what we're talking about now is not so much to, to say that our intelligence agencies aren't working. They're, they're working and doing a good job. But in this particular case, you have to wonder how in the world does, does somebody who is, and, and, and I'm going to try to get to what I think is the answer, you have somebody who who goes to Russia and then goes to that dangerous area of Russia. I can't remember exactly what. Dextani, I think. Or, or, uh, I can't pronounce it. I can't pull it out right yeah. now. Yeah. But it, it's a, a part of Chechnya. Yeah. And, and where there's a lot of terrorism and a lot of, a lot of jihadists and a lot of uh, people who, who, who kind of turn people into terrorists. Mm -hmm. And the Russians apparently told us about this guy and said, you know, be warned. He is a dangerous character. And then we dropped the ball on that. And that's the part that really merits investiga investigating. Because what really galls me about all of these terrorist attacks and the response to them is that, is that especially this administration, but, but even previous to that, the Bush administration was 
was very reluctant to call them Islamic jihadists, which is what they are. Now, does that mean that every Muslim is a jihadist? No. no. But does it mean that most, of, that most of these terrorist attacks are coming from jihadist Muslims? And the answer yes. is yes. And so we need to have a greater discussion of that. And quite frankly, just as, just as the stop and frisk policies of the New York Police Department have done a wonderful job of reducing the amount of mayhem and murder and violent crime and gun crime in New York because if you look suspicious, and it doesn't matter what color you are, if you look suspicious, they're going to stop, ask you what you're doing, and they're going to frisk you. And if they find a gun, boom, you're go you go to prison. Gone. That's it. Yeah. And so stop and frisk has worked, and they are profiling people who look suspicious. And quite frankly, the Islamic community tends to be the place that is the source of these jihadists. And so uh, extra attention needs to be paid to that community, and we need to ask the people in that community who abhor jihadism mm -hmm. to expose the jihadists or the suspected jihadists. And so that was... That was a lot's going to come from this on, on how better to protect ourselves going forward. Krama, a friend of mine posted not long ago, uh, we were talking and he said, you know, we, we, have this, uh, we have this theory of coexistence, but coexistence only works if both sides don't want to kill the other. If one side wants to kill the other, you cannot coexist with that. Correct. Because all that's going to happen is you're going to die. Right. Um, have we become, I think I know the answer to this, but have we become so politically correct? Because you're advocating uh, the stop and frisk. You're advocating, uh, in, in some cases, it sounds like profiling, et cetera. All these things that we've been told are bad. Have we become so politically correct that we, we, we have, have weakened our defenses to the point that this, this could be just the start? Well, these people succeeded because their devices worked. The other people failed because their devices didn't work. And so in the future, there's going to be more people who succeed because their devices work if they build good devices. And we're going to have more of this. And, and we live in it. We want to have a free society. But, for example, when we go to the airport, we get searched. We can mm -hmm. be frisked. We agree to all kinds of things to be able to get on an airplane. Right. When we go to a football stadium, my wife has to open her purse. They have to look at her purse. If I'm carrying something, that gets frisked. That gets looked at. Why not for the Boston Marathon or any public event like this that if you're inside of a certain radius uh, or diameter, whatever the right term uh -huh. is, if you're inside that, that anything, perimeter. Any, yeah. a perimeter, very good. If you're, if you're inside the perimeter and, you've, and you're carrying something, the police have the right to look inside it and make sure that they know what's in there. That's a very legitimate thing, and the public, I think, would agree to that because I agree to it when I go to a football game because I want everybody else sure. who's going into that stadium but in to a, also be but, checked. But a public event like this that stretches across public areas, mm -hmm. um, it, it, that's almost an impossibility because the amount of, and I'll use Boston for the example, because that would then entail uh, searching every hotel room every hotel room occupant, uh, every piece of, it, it becomes a massive. We're, we're talking about a couple of different things. I'm not saying, when you go into a stadium, everybody is funneled yes. through, a, through a spot. Yeah. And, and so it's easy to check everybody. Yes. I'm not saying that you necessarily can check everybody. Just like in New York City, they don't stop and frisk everybody. everybody. Okay. What you do is you say, for this public event, there's going to be a perimeter. If you are carrying something and you're inside that perimeter, you can be stopped and you can be asked to show what's in there, and and uh, just as you would be if you're trying to enter a studio because uh, a stadium, because you're inside the perimeter for the event. Okay. And that's what I'm saying All is right. that is that we should be able in, in these public events to have a stop and frisk policy uh, for anybody who's inside a perimeter. And, and you're not going once again, you're not going to catch everybody, but if, but there were so many, this, these guys, these two guys, they walked past so many policemen carrying their backpacks. And, and nobody thought anything about and it. And nobody thought anything about it. And probably, probably police thought if they stopped and asked them, it'd be a warrantless search. Both of these, both of these students, people, um, criminals, were U.S. citizen by going through the immigration process. Right. 
now that one is dead, the other, the, the younger brother, the 19-year-old in the hospital, do you believe he is a criminal or an enemy combatant? Well, you can be both. And here's what's key here. The administration apparently, from, from what I understand, could be wrong, but I think they've read him his Miranda rights and said, you're going to be, you're going to be prosecuted as a criminal and you're going to be read your Miranda rights now. Um, I've heard people say, designate him as an enemy combatant, question him as an enemy combatant, then read him his Miranda rights, and then, and then put him through the criminal justice, through the courts uh, as an American citizen. Now, the left says, oh no, you can't even declare him a, an enemy combatant because he's an American citizen. I disagree with that. I've heard other people say that's just not the case. Now, Senator Feinstein was on Fox News, and, and her reaction to uh, Congressman King's saying, you can absolutely designate him as an enemy combatant, question him as an enemy, enemy combatant, and then, then read him as Miranda rights and treat him as a, as a common criminal. You can do that. And Dianne Feinstein's reaction was, well, I don't think that saying that is helpful. Well, give me a break. I don't think saying that is helpful. That's what she says about, don't attack me on assault weapons. Don't even talk about it. That's not helpful. Well, you know what? That's just trying to shut down the person who has a disagreement with yeah. you. And, um, and, and so, so what you have in this situation, and then you have now, you have Napolitano, who has testified before Congress. I don't know if it's the House or the Senate, where she's now having to walk back a lot of her own testimony where she said, I didn't know this, or I didn't know that, or my department didn't know this, or didn't know that, the Russians didn't, got, got, and now they're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, they did, we did know. Well, why, why do they do that? Well, but you've got the same situation with, with uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and the Benghazi issue, who said and testified under oath, last I heard, if you do this, it's called perjury, but apparently that doesn't matter anymore. Oh, is. <laughs> I know what you mean, is, is. <laughs> Your definition of is. Yeah. Um, you're going to kill you later. Um, but she testified under oath, knew nothing about the request for this extra security in Benghazi, uh, you know, never saw any cables, anything like this. And now the investigation turns up a signed document with her name on it that says, no, you can't have any more defense preparations in Benghazi. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see that that's not, this story has more, there's more to it. Oh, it's got legs. So this, well, there'll be more information that comes out. And if in fact, if in fact, it becomes absolutely clear that Hillary Clinton knew that they had requested additional security and she personally said, no, you're not getting the additional security. I'd say that her political career is in jeopardy and, and the testimony for, for her false testimony will go right next to her on-air um, uh, uh, claims that, that she had to duck bullets when she was in Afghanistan. And uh, they actually had the video clips of that, which she had to then walk that back to. And, you know, the other one was she said she was she named after the mountain climber, uh, uh, Hillary. Oh, yeah, uh, the, and it turned Sir out, Hillary, yeah. Yeah, it turned out, that, turned out that he climbed the mountain after she was born. Uh, so she, that, one, that, that story didn't work either. <sighs> So, but there's more to both. There's more to both of these stories that's, that's going to come. And I think that our security uh, for, for public events will be, will be heightened. And, and it is my hope that just as if we go into a studio, we agree to have our, 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 our bodies or what we're carrying searched. Yeah. I think the same thing will end up happening here. Sounds like those three examples you gave on the former Secretary of State, sounds like one of those opportunities where it is best to keep a fire extinguisher around when you pull on your trousers. Coming up next, you're going to take a flight, pack a lunch. We'll be back on Political Soup. Bandwidth for today's show is brought to you by SoftLayer.com. We love SoftLayer here at Talkopolis. They are the greatest hosting company ever. They make everything easy. Check out their website at SoftLayer.com. Thanks again for sponsoring the show. And welcome back, everybody, to Political Soup. Joe Williams, Crom Carmichael. Crom, we were told that this, the sky was going to fall down, and gracious, 
sequester has made the sky not fall down, but we can't get into it because we're under so many delays because of these cuts to the FAA. How in the world? I mean, how long is it going to take the Republicans to come back and get us back in the air? You know, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is another example of a politician, in this case, it's the president, who is trying to inconvenience the public to try to send a message. Now, in our own state, Governor McWhorter, and I thought a lot of Governor McWhorter, I liked Ned McWhorter a lot, and when he reluctantly, and I say reluctantly, tried to pass an income tax, he said that if we don't pass an income tax, the school buses will not run, and right. I don't remember what year it was, but I do remember the date. He said the school buses will not run after April 1st. Because I remember at the time I was on the radio and I asked whether or not, I, whether or not the governor understood the irony of using April, April Fool's 1st, Day yeah. for, 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 for his threat. And the school buses stopped and somebody did get run over in a parking lot. And that was and, it. And the school buses started the next day. Now let's fast forward. Republican Governor Sundquist. When he tried to pass an income tax, he said, oh, things are terrible. If we don't pass an income tax, this, 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 and this will happen. So he takes everything that the public cares about or likes, the conveniences like the state parks and different things, and he cuts off the funding for those things to try to make things terrible. And he didn't get his income tax. Well, now we have the president who's now saying, because of the sequester, because of the sequester, we have to cut back on airport security, which means that it'll take longer for people to get through security and onto their planes. Now, in the first case, first place, when we fly, we pay a $5 tax for that security. Right. So the funding is absolutely there. Right. So that is, that is an absolute falsehood, what, what Obama's saying. That's number one. Number two, as they point out to, to uh, the, the uh, transportation infrastructure, uh, the House Transportation Infrastructure Chairman Bill Schuster suggests that the FAA whack $500 million of spending that they use for consultants and $325 Careful, million. Careful, man. Yeah, $325 <laughs> million for supplies and travel. Yeah. Now, you could do that. There are ways to reduce your spending. And frankly, you could probably reduce some bureaucrats who are sitting on their butt in Washington instead of reducing the people who are out at the airports. But we're going to have to live through this. And then the question is going to be, how does the media report it? And that, to me, there's two stories that are unrelated but still have a, a little well, bit of a knot in the middle. I, I don't know about Colin related. I, I know uh, I was I was kidding earlier in, in the tease about how much you like Ann Curry. Now I, I think actually you you do you you can deal with Ann Curry and think yeah. she's a fine reporter. And you you know let's face it, it, it was funny for those of you catching up. Uh, Ann Curry was uh, years at NBC. Mm -hmm. and was pushed onto the set as part of the team of the Today Show. Yeah, co-anchor with Matt Lauer. Lauer, Lauer. Lauer yeah. And <laughs> um, not long after, was pushed yeah. right out the door. Yeah, I mean, unceremoniously fired. But the interesting thing is I came across a story where apparently for the last few months that she was there, she felt like that she was tortured. That's a, that's, and that's, that's, that's her that word. in quotes. Yeah. That's her word in quotes. And because the staff love making fun of her. And this is not just her co-workers. These are her bosses. These are her producers. And they are, this is one where it says, even the show's executive producer, Jim Bell, supposedly took to teasing Curry. Shelter reports that Bell commissioned a blooper reel of Curry's worst on-air mistakes. And now, and it says another unnamed producer, another one, mm -hmm. Uh, claims that Bell once called staff members into his office to show a mistake Curry made while talking on air with a local station. Bell denies both incidents. Now, this is a producer. Now, if, if this were a private company with a whole, whole, uh, high-profile person, the media would love to be able to attack the higher-up who's beaten up on the lower-level employee. But in NBC, you won't get ABC. See, nobody, nobody will touch this story. Going, Look, and there's, so honor, and, there's honor among thieves. You're not, no, I'm not going to touch it because it may come back to me someday. Yes. Now, why does that relate to this story that we talked about earlier? And that is this. Let's watch how the media reports on these flight delays. 
let's see whether or not the media reports that we already pay a tax that funds the TSA. Mm -hmm. Let's see if they report that. Let's see if the media reports that there's $325 million that could be cut from supplies and travel or $500 million that's paid to consultants. Let's see if they do that or, or if they say that it's the nasty old Republicans and the sequester that's causing the problem. So let's watch that. And that's why the two stories, to me, are kind of interested, interesting because in one case, you've got, you've got uh, the higher-ups who have beaten up poor Ann Curry. Now, she wants a job someplace else, so she, she won't say a word. She cannot afford to say a word to anybody because let me tell you what happens. Even if you were wronged in a situation, her only option, even with this kind of stuff, would be to do what? File a complaint. And her next step, her only other option, is to file a federal suit of discrimination, hostile workplace. Let me tell you a little secret. She could win. She could win a nice amount of money, but she'll never work again in her chosen profession, not doing what she was doing, because even if she's right, she's still the one who sued her former employer, and employers in the future go, Ain't no way. Well, especially in the media business. Oh, God, yes. Especially well, in any business, but especially no, well, in the media. Well, because you've embarrassed people. Yes. And people well. in the media do not like being embarrassed. Oh, no, no, because well, they're she, But she could join Dan Rather at what's, where's he working now? Oh, where's he? Where is he? Is he, he current TV? Maybe? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's working for Al Jazeera, isn't know, he? I don't know where he Didn't is. They buy but him? that's the point. Yeah. That's the point. She could be joining him. What's the frequency, Mike? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Kenny, what's the frequency? Well, and, you know, it could be worse. And, and as far as the FAA situation goes, Crom, why don't we, uh, you know, we talk about closing some of these towers. What about some of these small airports? And, boy, I'm subject to get blasted for some friends of mine for this, uh, where heavy government subsidies are keeping small airlines in business where they're flying one or two people, three, four, but they fly every day. Yeah. There's three or four. Jackson, Tennessee is a perfect example. Jackson to Nashville uh, would never be able, you'd never be able to afford to operate even a Cessna out of that place. Guess what? Yeah. We're well, subsidizing it. Yes. Yes. And that, that would be another example of how the government could look at things and say, we just can't afford to do that. In this case, though, the, the, the money is there. And I'm, I'm really more focused right now on how is the media going to report this? Because if the media said, told the, told the story about this, Obama, just like McWhorter and Sunquist, would back off of doing this kind sure. of stuff. Well, I would take a little investigative reporting. Yes. And, and investigative reporting is absolutely a lost art. Well, this one, you unless, don't to, unless it's, this one you don't even have to look very hard. Well, I know. Yeah. So. One of us. You're getting out of here today? I am. Now, I understand you're going to, you're going to get on a plane? No, driving in a car. Smart move, yes, because you'll probably get there quicker yes. than if you tried to get on a plane. Folks, thanks for joining us this week on Political Soup. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you'll come back and see us again here on Talkopolis. I'm Joe Williams for Crom Carmichael. Been a great day. See you next time on Political Soup.